We have a constitutional revolution in Iran in 1906. We have a constitutional revolution in Russia in 1905. We have constitutional movements in China in 1911, in Mexico in 1912, I think. And generally what we start to see is the emergence of this idea that constitutionalism is the um, most, um, what you could call suitable um, form of um, governance um, in regards to um, the modern period. It's worth noting what's interesting, and in my research, I noticed a lot of this, which was whenever nations like Iran and the Ottomans and Malaysia, or, or shall we say the southern state of Johor Bahru in, uh, in Malaysia, um, attempted to facilitate a constitution for themselves. What's in, intriguing is on many occasions, the British archives show that the British were not happy about this, that the British were not, um, they, they were at times indifferent, but the idea that these nations could have constitutions is something which um, um, really um, sort of like um, left the British in a particular um, conundrum about whether they want to see these countries develop to that level or not. On the one hand, it is true that the British did want to see um, many nations in their sphere of influence to have a level of development because this um, created a particular relationship between the British and those nations. But at the same time, it's clear that the British did not want to see these nations um, either escape the colonial yoke or um, supersede or challenge the British in any shape or form. What's intriguing is that there is an assumption, however, that the Ottomans in particular, and then Iran and Malaysia uh, and so forth, um, established constitutionalism because this was inspired by the West or directly um, um, uh, facilitated by the West and imposed upon them. And what I started to this is yes, there is European nations specifically had constitutions. Um, what we also see, however, is that a lot of these projects were very indigenous in the way that they operated. Um, there was a Muhammad Hamidullah. So when I was uh, teaching in Turkey, Muhammad Hamidullah from Hyderabad is quite famous. And he wrote, he, he wrote a little pamphlet um, making the case that the, in Medina, um, that is the first constitution in Islam. Um, Ovami Anjum, um, who's an academic at Toledo University and writes for Yakin Institute, was a little bit more um, skeptical whether it's, it can be called a constitution in Medina. Um, some Muslim academics have made the case that this is a charter, um, less so a constitution in the modern sense. Um, and if that is the argument, and if that is the case, fact it's um, and that's the first time in the Muslim world or in a Muslim nation or, or a country with a Muslim government shall we say had a constitution the question is why liberalism and revolutionary activity seem to go hand in hand to some degree they seem to go side by side which is quite fascinating for someone like me in that sense now the other reason why constitutionalism was interesting and it was interesting to me was that in the modern context, a lot of the nation states that, Muslim nation states in particular that have emerged, they, um, there's always been a debate, a discussion, whether it's uh, Muslim movements in opposition to government or government themselves, or even members of the ulama like in Azhar and so forth, who have made the case for constitutional theory in some shape or form, which is quite intriguing. There is an assumption that the modern nation state in particular um, is the perfect architect in regards to creating what they would call a constitution that facilitates the needs of Islam. And, we'll, and yet what makes the Ottoman case unique, once again, is that it's the caliphate, that's one, and it's a constitutional caliphate. It's a constitutional sultanate as, as well, which has to be taken into consideration. But nonetheless, it is also a constitutional caliphate. And then what happens in the Ottoman period is that constitutional amendments are made as um, the 
is drastically changing because of the constitutionalism fell. was not good in Ottoman state. More contemporary Ottoman historians are making the case, however, that it wasn't constitutionalism that failed the Ottomans, but it's the Ottomans who failed the constitutional project. What they mean by that is that the real Ottoman constitution comes into fruition in 1908, but the Ottomans collapsed by 1918, that's a 10 year period. And from 1911 onwards, the Ottomans are in a continued state of warfare in which constitutional theory is not um, at the forefront of their now state evolution. And I'll give you an example. Mustafa Sabri Effendi, who is who was the Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire, one of the last Sheikh al-Islams of the Ottoman Empire, and you know, dies in Egypt teaching in Azhar after the creation of the Turkish Republic. Um, in his early career, he's a heavy constitutionalist. He's, in, he's involved in the Young Turk Revolution against Sultan Abdul Hamid II, which is really fascinating in many ways. And he supports the idea of the need to have a constitutional caliphate. And that seems to be his main objective, which is to establish a constitutional caliphate, because by having what he called um, the most optimal, optimal level of governance, that, that would bring a sense of, of um, peace and tranquility and would um, re rejuvenate the Ottomans um, in that sense to be able to once again become a, a, a world power in that sense. By the war period, um, as the Ottoman Empire is collapsing, Mustafa Sabri abandons the caliphate concept, I mean, the constitutional concept, and his main interest is now safeguarding what he calls the institution of the caliphate. So while he made the argument that the best caliphate is a constitutional caliphate. By the end of the war, his, own, his only interest now is whether it's a constitutional caliphate or an autocratic caliphate, nonetheless, a caliphate is better than a nation state. So you can see he's shifting objectives in that sense, right? And then once the, the Ottoman state um, is, has been abolished and Mustafa Sabri is living in Egypt and near the end of his years, as he gets quite old and recognizes the reality that a nation state is here to stay, Mustafa Sabri Effendi then makes the case of preserving and safeguarding Aqidah for Muslims in that sense. So you can see like how Mustafa Sabri's priorities were shifting as the conditions were shifting so rapidly. And what that indicates then is that, um, that the political project was an idealist uh, project to some degree in which they, they had a particular imagination that this would be the best type of project um, in terms of Muslim political theory. But because of the war, um, they fell back on a more traditionalist approach. And then after the realization that none of these is the need to safeguard the creed of Muslims because he's concerned that without a political entity that can safeguard the interests of the Muslims, that Muslims will be left to their own devices and they will be susceptible to whatever the zeitgeist of the world is at the time. It's really fascinating to see his evolution in that sense. And he was one of the people that I was researching in, in in, in, in that way. So why is Mustafa Sabri so obsessed with an idea of constitutional theory? Well, there's two reasons for that. One is because in Ottoman political culture, there is a particular culture in which sultanic authority has some level of conditions to it. There is a recognition that the sultan in of himself is not an absolutist. The reason why I wanna make this point to you is because there is an assumption ingrained in the minds of modern vocabulary, that when we use the word sultana, or when we use the word sultan, that we, the imaginations of despotism and autocracy come to mind, because that's how we envisage the idea of the monarchy. And yet what we see in the Ottoman period is that sultans was, were, were almost hostage to the political environment. Um, many sultans were executed, many sultans were killed, many sultans were removed from power, and the reason being is because to be a sultan was a precarious position to be in. If you did not abide by either the status quo, which is the political status quo, um, in any given time, your position as, as, um, of being sultan was on very rocky grounds. What that indicates, and this is um, Baki Tezjan, who's a historian, of um, the period of Osman II and Hussein Yilmaz, who wrote the book on Suleiman the, Mag 
magnificent, they both make the case that the Ottomans prior to modern constitutional theory had what they call constitutional practices or constitutional traditions. What they mean by that is that the political mechanism has room for disobedience, has room for delinquency, has room for revolt, and has room in its extremity for revolution. And revolution is the most extreme form of what you would call protest and negotiation regarding the politi political status quo. Revolutions in the Ottoman period were never to remove Islam from the political structure. Revolutions were always to maintain the status, I mean, the framework, but to, but to simply remove the government that was at the top. So what we see here is that in many ways, when we see revolutions taking place in the Ottoman period, this is not an attempt to remove or extract Islam. And this is very unique in Islamic history, that whenever we've seen revolutionary activity within the Muslim world, the tendency has always been, historically anyway, including the revolution in 79 in Iran, or some sort of Islamic restoration. And so we see that in the voice and the vocabulary of the revolutionaries in of themselves, they're always uh, positing the idea of the need to revive Islam, to reestablish Islam, to, to renew Islam, to bring Islam back, to rejuvenate the state, which is supposed to be Islamic. This also happens in the case of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and I'll explain that later. So what the point I'm making then, then, constitutionalism in the Ottoman context, the word they use is meshrutiyet or meshru. So meshrutiyet in Turkish or, um, is the idea of having what it means is conditional. It's a conditional government. And this is interesting because the case is then made then that the Ottomans have always had a political structure which was conditional. One, the condition is the baya is interesting. Firstly, is a contract. And the contract is an indication of particular conditions that the leader of the state has to abide by. In this case, the Sultan as Caliph. The second interesting thing is if they have a what they call a, a hal fatwa. Sir. A hal fatwa is a fatwa that has the that is simply written to remove the sultan from power. And a sultan can never be removed from authority without this fatwa being uh, written or, or in that sense. Now, as mo most of you know, fatwas are generally just legal, they're just opinions. They're not legally binding in any shape or form. But the hal fatwa in the Ottoman context, once it was written, that was always binding. And it's very unique because it's one of the few fatwas in terms of fatwa culture that we have in the Ottoman period, and even in the modern period, in which it, it gives the permission to remove the ruler from authority. We don't see this type of culture or the prevalence of this type of culture prior to the Ottomans in that sense. This is a very unique Ottoman construct in that sense. So we already have two unique mechanisms in regards to um, reducing sultanic authority. And in that sense, one of the points I want to make then is the idea of sultan um, sort of like internalized as being despotic is a little bit troublesome and problematic for us Ottoman historians. And we see in, in newspapers today when they say Erdogan, the Sultan Erdogan, what they imply is not only that Erdogan is an autocrat, and that's, I'm not here to debate that argument in of itself, if people have different opinion on that, but it also in, has an ingrained assumption that the Ottomans were also autocrats because it's leaning on a language which is relatable to Ottoman history. And what I'm saying to you is um, Ottoman governance was conditional and revolutionary and, and revolts as activities were indications of that. So that's really important to understand. Um, so between the 17th and 19th century, we have, um, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19, 19. We have 19 occasions in which some sort of revolt or revolutionary activity has taken place in Istanbul um, against sultanic authority. Uh, six of which have, um, have ended up with sultans being removed from power um, in that sense. So the point I'm making here then is that you can see that Istanbul um, and having authority in Istanbul in that in that moment was not simply that the Sultan can just do whatever he wants. So as I mentioned before, Baki Tezjan and Hussein Yilmaz have made the argument that the Janissaries and the ulama with their different forms of power, the ulama regarding their authority um, regarding Islam, 
Muslim public opinion and being mediators between government and society were one of the pillars of holding sultanic authority to account. The second authority was clearly the Janissaries who were a military force um, who had the physical means to remove the Sultan from power. So you have these two institutions prior to um, you know, the abolishment of the Janissaries in 1830, 1829. What you see is that these two institutions are working traditionally as a way of making sure that the Sultan is not an absolutist. Now, these two institutions are also put in some particular forms of checks and balances. Um, the ulama are held to account uh, by the Sultan um, in regards to his authority as being caliph. And as a result of his authority as being caliph, he would on many occasions um, apply pressure on the ulama as an institution. And then obviously the ulama and the, the khalifa, they had the ability to, to um, galvanize public opinion against the Janissaries if the Janissaries stepped out of line. And so this um, contestation of these different institutions of power um, were the traditional forms of what we would call traditional, in some ways, constitutional practice, right? And so that's what happens now in the 19th century. So what's the difference? In the 19th century, we have the abolishment of the Janissaries. So the Janissaries are now abolished. And so no longer is there a sort of like military institution that can continuously execute what you would call military coups to, move, to remove the Sultan from power. And instead the Ottoman state becomes a bureaucratic state. It's now becoming a more modern state in that sense in which um, the, um, public opinion is becoming, as I mentioned two weeks ago, far more important. Literacy is improving in that sense. So the Ottoman public are becoming far more literate. And because there's no longer Janissary force, the contestation now is taking place regarding law. Legal theory is the tool that's being used now to hold the Sultan to account. It's not a physical force, but it's the law itself. And so you're starting to see the development of the idea of constitutionalism in the Ottoman context, which is that we need a written documentation that can explain to society the rules of what it means to be a Ottoman caliphate. And so what the relationship is with the governor and the governed, this is very unique. And so the Ottoman constitution in 1876, the movement towards Ottoman constitutionalism in 1876 is driven towards um, strengthening the, the authority of the Sultan and um, clarifying the relationship of all the institutions of the state to society. This is very new. This is very unique in the Ottoman context in that sense. What the Ottomans do in 76 is fascinating because they take books and documents from all over the world, not only Europe. This is the thing that I noticed in my research. The assumption is, is that they took con constitutions only from the Europeans. The British didn't have a constitution and the Ottomans really considered having a system which is like the British in many ways, which is just the regular status quo, which is that the Quran and Sunnah is sufficient. We don't need this written documentation. And in reality, we just keep passing laws and that would regulate society and state and that would be sufficient for us. But there was a movement within um, the Ottoman elites and intelligentsia that felt that um, a written documentation in of itself was far more binding. And what did they want to do? They wanted to, to restrict um, authorities, not only the caliph, but the other institutions so that they don't get ahead of themselves and become ultimately too powerful. The reason why this is happening is because in the Tanzimat period, as we mentioned, the period of reform, the Sultan in of himself becomes quite weak and the sublime port, the office of the Grand Vizier becomes quite dominant and powerful. And as a result of that, there is a intellectual movement that's taken place in the 19th century by a, a group of individuals called the Young Ottomans um, who are thinkers and religious, by the way, who feel that we need a new constitutional system to strengthen the authority of the Sultan. 76 is very unique. In 1861, the Tunisian constitution when, um, is written by Khairuddin al-Tunisi. And Khairuddin al-Tunisi is a really fascinating character. When he writes the constitution in Tunisia, he says that I took my inspiration from the projects that have been taking place in the Ottoman Empire prior to what I did. So you can see this. In 1876, 
Abdul Hamid II invites Khaydin al-Tunisi to Istanbul to be the Grand Vizier of this new constitutional project. And so what we see is that, um, unfortunately, we, we can't access the debates about um, constitutionalism because um, there was a fire in the palace and a lot of these archives got burnt and destroyed. Um, but what's interesting is Ahmed Midat Effendi, who's one of the key um, confidants of Abdul Hamid II, he writes a pamphlet explaining the, the theories of, of constitutionalism. And he says that they were split into two groups, the um, Taraf Giran, which means the supporters, and Hilaf Giran, which means the one in opposition. Hilaf is Turkish, but is Hilaf from Arabic, right? And he said the Taraf Giran were broken up into two groups. One group said that the constitution should be a bottom-down project. It should be a project done by um, the elites of the Ottoman state. Society doesn't understand what constitutionalism is. And the only way that we can have a constitutional government is it has to come top down. Another group of thinkers, they said, no, a true constitutional theory would have to include people within, this, within society. And so it should be bottom up. A, a top down approach is not ideal. And a bottom up approach is a better way of uh, institutionalizing constitutional theory. The people in opposition, the Hilafkiran, were also split into two groups. The first group was, they made the argumentation that yes, it's possible and plausible to have a constitution, but such a radical transformation in the state political structure would be problematic and dangerous for the state. And now is not the right time to do it. So fundamentally what you're seeing is three of the four groups in principle are not against constitutionalism. They just have different um, apprehensions and ideas regarding what the constitution should be. However, there once was one group of people that believed the constitution was bitter. That it should not be, it's an innovation, it's not Islamic and we shouldn't have it. So the point I'm making is these four groups included ulama across the ranks. Okay, so I, um, often what um, Western academics did is they threw all the ulama in, in the opposition camp. But what we're seeing is this is not the case. In reality, the ulama were across the ranks in this. It's just that Western academics were too, too sloppy in, in, in just making the case that the ulama are reactionary to everything. Because as we mentioned two weeks ago, and this is part of the problem, there is an assumption that the Ottoman ulama were just reacting to everything and didn't allow any innovation or change to take place, which is not necessarily the case. Anyway, in 1876, Abdul Hamid II decides that he's not interested in the constitutional project because along with the constitution, they opened up the parliament and parliamentarianism was slowing down the decision-making process. This was part of the problem, which was that, um, do we have a system where the Sultan just decides he has um, a small band of people that um, tell him, give him advice that's sufficient for him and he can use that as a way of making decisions or should each decision be passed through parliament and the parliamentary process was very slow and the Ottomans went to war with the Russians in 77, 1877 and lost that war and as a result Abdul Hamid just thought this was a mistake so he, he closes down the parliament and he freezes the constitution. The constitution is still being published and printed in the Ottoman newspapers every year, which is interesting. What that indicates is that there is still a feeling of the idea of constitutional theory within society. What we start to see, which is very fascinating for me, is that amongst Salafist thinkers like Rashid Ridda, like Muhammad Abdul, like uh, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, um, like um, Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi, um, his, um, uh, like uh, Ab Abdul Rahman al-Zahrawi, um, and Muhammad Alusi. These, so these are thinkers in Iraq, in Damascus, in Palestine, in Egypt, of a more Salafi, Salafi inclination. And, and Salafism in the 19th century is a very different phenomenon than what we're seeing today. It's a reformist movement in, in that period of time. Um, and what they're arguing is um, the, the necessity of Muslim societies to have a constitution. It's very in interesting in that sense. Why am I saying that? Because in, in Iraq, I'm doing some research on an alim right now. His name is, um, in Iranian literature, his name is uh, um, Ayatollah Muhammad Husseini 
Al Naini, but in the Ottoman documentation, his name is Ayatollah Muhammad Husseini Al Najafi Al Naini because he lived in Najaf. And he wrote a book on constitutional theory regarding the idea of imama and constitutionalism. And what we see is a lot of his ideas regarding constitutional theory was similar to what was happening in Istanbul and the Arab provinces. He was drawing his ideas from constitutionalism from what was happening amongst the ulama in the Ottoman world. That is really fascinating in that sense to see that. And you can see like it's intriguing, like the, even the terminologies he's using and the words he's using like istibdad, despotism, uh, for a uh, meshrutiyet, um, and so forth, you're seeing like um, Shura, he's, he's drawing all of these terms. Um, he's taken them from the sort of like intellectual milieu that's emerging in, in the, the Hamidian period. On the, so what's fascinating is on the one hand, Sultan Abdul Hamid is not too keen on constitutionalism because he wants to maintain the status quo in the manner in which he's doing his, his ruling. And yet on the other hand, um, amongst the, the thinkers and the elites um, across the Ottoman domains, we are seeing um, a, a, a sort of like ex, a, a explosion of thinkers writing about constitutional theory. This is really unique and, and interesting for me. Why this is interesting is because the majority of the works in Western academia have made the case that the constitutional theorists in the Ottoman domains were all liberal. They were secular and they were liberal. And yet, what I've noticed, and this is now becoming more and more accepted as I'm challenging many more Ottoman historians, is that the majority of the theorizers regarding constitutional thought were ulema, because they were legal practitioners. And constitutionalism for the ulema was beneficial because it gave them a stake in the decision-making process because who was gonna write the constitutions? The ulama were writing the constitutions because they were legal practitioners. We had no secular legal practitioners in that context. So the ulama held particular cards and they could fashion the authority that the, the Sultan as Caliph could, could display. In that sense, constitutionalism would put the ulama in a very powerful position. And this is very important to recognize this because I feel and this is one of the parts of my um, research, which I'm working on right now. And, and it's something that, um, that is very understudied um, by Muslims in particular, because Muslims um, don't look at this late period of Ottoman history in that sense. So what happens now? All right, 1908, there's a revolution that takes place um, and revolutionary activity. In 1876, the constitutional project is top down, it's state driven, it's very pragmatic. In 1908, constitutionalism becomes ideological. The reason it becomes ideological is because it gets attached to revolutionary activity, revolutionary ideas. And revolutions in particular, um, in that sense, have to have an ideological component to justify the revolutionary activity. So we are seeing a shift in 1908 regarding constitutional theory. The Young Turks clearly moved against Sultan Abdul Hamid II. And the only way they could um, justify their revolution in that sense is to suggest that it was done in the need for a new constitution. The Ottoman constitution needed to return. And what was interesting is when constitutional theory was being posited uh, the need for requirement, the verse in the Quran which says, obey Allah, obey the messenger and those in authority from amongst you became once again a verse that became heavily contested. Mahmud II, when he was doing his centralizing reforms in, um, in 1831 in particular, he, he told his Sheikh al-Islam to um, write a document to suggest that there should be absolute obedience to the Khalifa. And that the verse in the Quran, which says, obey Allah, obey the messenger and those in authority from amongst you was an indication that Muslims must give absolute obedience to the Khalifa. What's intriguing here is that many ulama across the Ottoman domains rejected that case because they made the argumentation that rebellion was permitted so long as the uh, Khalifa abided by Islam. But they also extended that out by saying it wasn't simply the idea that the Khalifa had to abide by the Sharia. If the Khalifa was doing A, B, C, and D, there are still room to maneuver. And so what we see is that whereas in 1831, the verse is being used from the Quran 
to suggest that Muslims ought to be absolutely loyal to the Khalifa. And Sultan Abdul Hamid II also, Yusuf al-Nabahani is a scholar who writes this, who also says this about um, Sultan Abdul Hamid, that the absolute authority should be given to the Khalifa. In the constitutional amendments in 1909, this verse is re, um, reinterpreted. And the way it's reinterpreted is this. The verse says, obey Allah. It then says, obey the messenger. So the word obey is mentioned twice. And then it says, and then those in authority from amongst you. It doesn't say, and obey those. So the word on the third occasion, those people of authority from amongst you, because the word obey is omitted the third time, the argumentation is delinquency, rebellion, and revolution is possible, is permitted because of the fact that um, um, the caliph is not given absolute authority. The caliph can only be uh, obeyed if you obey Allah and you obey the messenger. The reason why this is interesting is because then the ulama would find ways of making the case, the legal case, that the caliph has not been obeying Allah or obeying the messenger. It gives them that room to maneuver. The second point in the verse that they raise is the idea of, and those in authority from amongst you. The traditionalists made the argument that those in authority meant the caliph and the caliph alone. But by 1909, uh, many of the ulama are starting to make the case that those in authority mean the ulama and the parliamentarians. It's not simply the Khalifa that's a person of authority, but it's all the people of the state machinery. They are the people of authority from amongst you. So you start to see what's interesting is on the one hand, a particular interpretation of the verse in the early period of Ottoman history is interpreted in one way of giving absolute obedience. By 1908, during the revolutionary phase, um, this verse is now being um, understood in a totally different way as a way of supporting constitutional theory. And it's in this moment we see an explosion of works by the ulama explaining why a constitutional theory is better than an unconstitutional one. And so once again, this is why I want to highlight to you how revolutionary activity and constitutionalism, these two um, sort of like, um, you know, um, how can I say, and it, um, ideas have become amalgamated as one in the Ottoman context in that sense. What's interesting in Ottoman history, and this will be my last point because, um, you know, I don't want to go over the top here. The word in kilab, what's interesting, when the word in kilab was first introduced to the Ottoman vocabulary, people didn't understand what that meant. And the reason why the word in kilab was introduced, because in Arabic, um, thora, which meant revolt, was very aggressive. And the idea that people are going to do a thora against the Sultan as Khalifa was unimaginable. Like, that's not what we're doing. And um, the Ottomans used the word ihtilal. So the idea that this inkilab, so people started asking, what is this inkilab you're talking about? What is this inkilab you're doing? And they said, it's a transformation. We're demanding a transformation. Inkilab is to make the case for transformation in that sense. So it's very interesting that even the revolutionaries were very careful in, in the language they were using regarding the, uh, the transformation of the Ottoman state. And one final point. Um, often constitutional theory and revolutionary activity is seen from the perspective of the French Revolution. What needs to be understood is when the French Revolution was taking place, the Ottomans were very negative when they were seeing France regarding the French Revolution. It was very violent. A lot of people died and the idea was about separating church from state. The Ottomans never wanted to do that. So when in, in the 19th century, there's a reimagination and a romanticization of the French revolutions, many people in Ottoman society were very skeptical when revolution was being mentioned. And so in this sense, what you start to see is while the slogans of the French revolution were being professed at the same time, multiple Islamic slogans were also being professed. What we're talking about here then is that the Ottoman constitution is a hybrid constitution and hybrid constitutions don't necessarily have to be democratic. There can be many instances where we have constitutions in societies, not only uh, in non-Western societies in particular, that don't necessarily have to lead to um, the democratization of a particular society. And I don't think that the Ottomans are going down this route. The Ottomans want to maintain a balance between the particular structures they have, but at the same time, streamlining their political 
um, um, so, um, state structures that, in that sense. And so what we're seeing is this rapid movement. Now, the collapse of the Ottomans doesn't mean the end of constitutional theory. We have constitutions, as I said, in Malaysia, we have constitutions in Pakistan, we have constitutions in Afghanistan, and in these constitutions, the ulama were involved in it. We have constitutions in Egypt, we have a constitution in Iraq and Syria. And once again, when we see these early constitutional movements, you can see that they have a strong component um, of, of the ulama's involvement. What's different between the Ottoman constitution and the constitutions of the nation state in many instances is that in the nation state, there is um, the need to define what the role of Islam is. Whereas in the Ottoman context, that wasn't the case, the, the need to define Islam's role, because the argument was that the constitution itself was from Islam. And so they said that Quran, Sunnah, and the constitution is, they call it kanun isasi, meaning the fundamental law, and it was from the kanun culture, which means that Islam legislated for this. It's just that in the modern period, whereas in the past we had constitutional traditions, in the modern period, we need a constitutional document. So just to sum up, the point I'm trying to make to you is how I want you to understand the complexity of revolutionary activity in the Ottoman period and how Islam and revolutions function to some degree in that sense. And I want you to understand that, that there is something indigenous that was taking place in Muslim societies globally, actually, not only in the Ottoman period, but globally, in which they were moving towards constitutional theory, but at the same time, they were trying to, um, you know, um, make their, reform their states and as a way, have a more accountable governmental structure. And so you're starting to see these two um, ideas becoming far more prevalent and prominent. Okay, I hope I haven't uh, blasted you with too much information again. Um, but yeah. <laughs>